don't get out enough. <laughs> uh, thank you very, very much. That, that was really sweet. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, thank you, of course, to Wyatt and to Cherie, who have been generous in sustaining friends and supporters. I, I'm very grateful. Uh, thank you to Kevin, because you're great. Uh, Thank you to the staff who have saved me so many times and from my various um, fits of forgetfulness and um, balls that have gotten dropped. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, David. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Khaki. Uh, no, you bet. You bet. But, um, this uh, some of you know this book is based on the life of my father's mother, my grandfather, and, or my grandmother, and my, uh, my dad was insanely excited that I was writing this book, and the fact that I was airing a fair amount of um, ugly family linen didn't seem to bother him a bit. Uh, so he was really, really happy that the book was coming out. And he did, he read it in manuscript, but he died two days before the book was released last year. Yeah, I know, I know. And it was, that was hard. So I, I start my readings with a little shout out to dad. And if he's listening, I hope he's pleased with what he hears. This is set in, the section I'm gonna read is set in Kansas in a town I made up called Grant Station in 1901. Uh, you need to know just a few things before I get going. The main character is named Nell Platt. She lives with her husband Jack on his family's farm in Kansas. They have a baby girl named Lucille who is a difficult, colicky child. She's, she's hard. But, um, uh, a little while before the section I'm going to read, a, a circuit rider came through town and talked to Nell about California. And she hasn't quite been able to shake that idea out of her head. And perhaps coincidentally, she's noticed posted in the train station that the one-way rail fare to Los Angeles is $110. Um, she is, without letting anybody know about this, she has been making dresses for the minister's wife in town. Um, she hasn't told anybody about this. She often sews through the night doing the family um, seamstressing, and so she slipped a few extra dresses in there and has not told anybody that she's getting paid for this. Um, and the only thing you need to know is that in the scene right before I get started, she has just told her husband Jack that she's expecting their second child, uh, a piece of news that neither of them is exactly overjoyed to have. In the morning, Jack's mother greeted me from the stove where she was making gravy by saying, you can name the new one after my mother or father. Her mother was Amelia, her father, Rupert. Lucille was named after no one, a name I picked because I found it pretty. My pa want, might, might want to say, I said. He can have the next one, the rate you're going, he won't have to wait long. Her words were calm, her stirring ferocious. I thought maybe we'd slow down now, I said, stop working so hard. With the new one already coming, you're fixing to work harder than ever, or at least straight through the night. Guess you don't need to sleep. I'll sleep soon, I told her. It would have been good for you to tell me you were setting up business. Jack must have told her about the new baby. I don't know who told her about Mrs. Cooper. I said, the Reverend's wife asked me to make her a dress. I'm not exactly Sears Roebuck. But you're not just doing a kindness, are you? I'll contribute to the household, I said. She was stirring so hard that the gravy was frothing in the pan. It doesn't look good when a woman doesn't know what's going on in her own family. I like to sew, I said, as if that answered anything. My God, you are too old to act like a child. Either from too much heat or her lashing, the gravy bubbled up onto the searing cooktop and the kitchen filled with smoke and the half-sweet smell of scorched lard. My mother-in-law yanked the pan off the stove and dropped it into the dry sink, then pulled off her apron and turned her back on me. It's your mess, she said as she left the room. Clean it. I wiped the stove, made fresh gravy as best I could, then hung out and beat the bedding before she returned, wordless. She was genuinely angry, which saddened me. We had been, if not friends, then comrades. Now her mistrust dragged after me like a train. When we were together in the house, she walked into rooms I had just exited and lifted plates that I had just set down. When I came back from the garden, she met me at the door. If I was going to deceive her now, I would have to be twice as artless, as transparent as water. When I offered to make her cuffs for her day dress, she accepted without comment. Nell goes on to 
uh, make another, to agree to make another dress for the reverend's wife, something very lavish made out of silk, something that certainly could not be worn in Grant Station, Kansas. But um, she, uh, she takes a, a look at the picture with Mrs. Cooper before she comes home. I spent the ride home worrying about the gathers over the bustle, and by the time I'd helped Jack unhitch the horses, I had a solution. I kept it in the front of my mind through feeding and changing Lucille, through supper, through dishes and breaking the ice over the horse's water trough, the baby strapped to me and gnawing on a radish. My mother-in-law's quilt needed repair. The cotton batting had worked through a worn spot and now stuck out like a toe. She had to remind me about it twice. I had been thinking about two long darts down the back of a skirt and how fabric might be doubled to give a flounce greater weight. Lucille and I had gone straight from Mrs. Cooper's house to Mr. Cates's store, where we bent over the glistening fabric that Mr. Cates brought out from his locked back room. He also kept his liquor there, and Nettie Harper loved to insist, opium, although none of us would recognize opium if he displayed it on a plate. This cloth here, it belonged to the first Mrs. Cates. It was her dowry, Mr. Cates said. He had a quick eye for profit and had been known to stretch the truth about his wares, but on this occasion I believed him. The light blue silk slid under my hands like water, so densely woven that even lying folded on the shelf, it gleamed. As blue as the ocean, I said, and he agreed, neither of us having seen an ocean. At home now, I petted the silk, hidden behind, beneath the grubby denim in the mending pile. Lucille reached out her little hand, too, though I did not let her touch. She loved things that glittered, pins or mother-of-pearl buttons or the brass lamp base. My mother-in-law laughed and said she would make a good man miserable someday. Jack said the same thing and did not laugh. I didn't laugh either. Lucille was an unnerving mirror, allowing me to catch sight of myself in glimpses I had not asked for and did not desire. One afternoon, she spied a crust of snow outside the window illuminated by a shaft of late sunlight. I watched her gaze at the blaze of cold light until the sun dropped a little and the brightness was gone. For a held instant, Lucille didn't move, and I felt the child's disappointment like a pinprick. She turned to me, waiting for me to, to, what? Make the light return? Provide some new brilliance of my own? We gazed at each other, and then she opened her mouth, and the howling did not stop for hours. She wanted things. I would have wished it otherwise. I walked and rocked her, showed her my mother-in-law's cut glass bowl and hat pin, promised her that she would get her heart's desire. I lied to her, and when I felt guilty, I lied more, assuring her that diamonds would come, ropes of rubies, castles made of crystal, and shoes. Weeks of nothing but sunshine, followed by weeks more. Eventually, my lies wore her down, or her own tantrums did, and she dropped into black, silent sleep. Her head slumped toward her shoulder, the dark curls pasted down by the same sweat that coated her plump legs. If I picked her up to carry her to the crib, her damp shadow remained on the rug or floor. Anyone seeing her would have thought of a tiny coffin. She was that still. Don't, I whispered to her as I tucked the tiny quilt around her. Don't believe me. Don't be taken in. You know what you know. Poorly as we got along, she clung to me. I even had to take her to the outhouse with me. She didn't seem to mind the spiders. If I didn't want to hear the shrieks. Everybody that said that she cried because she sensed the approach of her brother or sister, and I let everybody say that. I did not want them to notice the calculation in her baby grip, the assessing look on her face that sharpened as she adjusted her focus on the world around her. I wondered whether she had learned that look from me and tried to look at her more tenderly, and she bit me. <laughs> By then, Jack and my mother-in-law were accustomed to Lucille's and my nocturnal habits, and so they had no particular comment when I worked on Mrs. Cooper's beautiful silk gown. Lucille and I finished the dress in six nights, with me staying up all, all the last night to feather stitch the slippery hem. I rode with Jack into town, and my weariness lifted to see Mrs. Cooper twirl before me, catching the light like a dragonfly. With the lilac trim around the high neck, the shadows around her eyes hardly showed at all. Such an improper dress for a reverend's wife, she said. There is not anything improper about it, I said. It is very decent. Her mouth twitching, she took my hand and rested it on the curve from waist to hip, which I was proud of. The gathers dropped in a lavish rush like a waterfall, tracing the line of Mrs. Cooper's slim frame beneath the yards of shining cloth. It is mostly decent, I said. She laughed and twirled again, then asked, will you make me another? Will you tell your friends? Oh, no, they already know. 
There was Mrs. Trimble, the banker's wife, and Mrs. Cates. There was mid widowed Mrs. Horn, whose husband had left her with six girls, 960 acres, and seven outhouses in back of her wood frame house because she didn't want anyone to have to wait. Pumping the sewing machine pedal, I'd had plenty of time to think about these ladies. I had calculated and projected. I can make children's clothes too, I said to Mrs. Cooper. Lucille sat on the floor between us in a blue canvas sailor dress, playing so quietly that not a curl was disarranged. I'd hardly known it was possible. Mrs. Cooper bent to finger the dress's wide collar. How old is she? Six months. She's a pretty child. At that moment, Lucille truly was a pretty child, dimpling and kicking her round feet. The reverend's wife's house had a pleasing effect on both of us. When Mrs. Cooper squeezed Lucille's hand, my daughter gurgled. Hush, love, I said mildly. You do love her, don't you, Mrs. Cooper said, when she lets me. You're brave, Mrs. Cooper said. I don't know about that. My mother said that a baby has to be a year old before you can allow yourself to start loving. In the first year, so many sicknesses can come. You cannot afford to be destroyed. She peered at me. Your mother didn't tell you? I never heard such a thing, I said. And then, meaning to soften the words, my mother doesn't say much. She tucked a curl behind Lucille's ear and waggled a finger for the baby to grasp. You, Missy, are a lucky girl. Your mother loves you. I looked at my dusty shoes. Maybe people ordinarily talked like this in Baltimore or Philadelphia, wherever Mrs. Cooper was from. To my relief, she straightened up and reached again for the mirror. She said, I can't go to see Mrs. Astor without a hat. Mr. Cates can order ribbon, I said. In the wagon, I pressed Lucille against me. This isn't love, I told her fiercely, my heart actually hurting. My complicated, difficult child. Who but a mother could possibly love her? I kissed her soft neck, which was grubby from the long day and smelled like dirt. I kissed it again. Lucille stared at the horse's rump and made an idle, ugly noise. This isn't love, I told her again, the words breaking apart in my mouth. We still have six months left. The new baby sagged in my womb. Lucille pulled away from me and tried to pinch my breast. For the rest of the ride home, to steady my shaking hands, I thought about money. I had given my mother-in-law three dollars from the first dress and three more from the second. The money, she ga the money gave me new rights, and I started sewing town dresses as soon as I had stacked the breakfast dishes. A dress for Mrs. Trimble to wear to Topeka, sailor suits for Mrs. Cates' twin boys, a whole wardrobe, a bonanza, for the housekeeper Mrs. Horn had shipped out from Killarney to scrub what my mother-in-law called outhouse row. Money I had never suspected in Grant Station materialized along with treasured pictures crumbling at the edges from a three-year-old Harper's Bazaar, the Sears catalog, even an ancient Godey's ladies book, but with bigger sleeves, or can you attach a train, or I think this high neck would suit me. I learned to steer wistful women past waists too delicate for their thickening bodies, showing them instead how prettily a skirt might hang from a substantial frame. I taught them to take pleasure in a thoughtful sleeve length. One night, Jack sat up beside me, watching for nearly 30 minutes while I stitched up a tight bodice, twice stopping to rip out stitches that were too big or had tilted off the marked seam. Leave it, he said. Little as those stitches are, nobody's going to see. They have to be right or the cloth won't stand up the way it's supposed to. My new clients turned those bodices inside out once they got home and examined every inch. If they found a wandering stitch, they would bring it back to me, as was their right. Mighty finicky work for a dress that'll just come out on Sundays. Gives a gal a reason to look forward to Sundays, I said, and caught his tired expression. It's pretty, Jack. Women want one pretty thing, like your mother and her rug. Pretty is reason enough, and I'm helping to pull us ahead. By then, I had given his mother $20 of my earnings and kept $38. If she, kept at my, if she guessed at my private fund, so far she hadn't given me a clue. Don't know that Grant Station can afford you doing this. I'd say that Grant Station is affording me just fine, us. Zeke Kloster said you're ruining his life. When he needed a new harness, he went to the coffee jar where they keep their household money, 50 cents in there. Where's the paper money, he asked Minnie, in Nell Platt's purse, she said. A first-rate wool dress with a tippet. It's an old-fashioned style, but it suits her. A harness costs $15. I can't be responsible for whatever all Minnie Kloster might be spending on. I made her a wool dress, $5 less the cloth. If Minnie's spending more, then Zeke had ought to ask her about that. My voice was calm, and my stitches so tiny I could feel them better than see them. Focusing on the nearly invisible seam kept me from meeting Jack's eyes, his look balanced between sadness and anger. 
Minnie had not fit, seen fit to tell Zeke about the other clothes she had ordered along with the wool dress, two blouses, three serge skirts, plus a set of handkerchiefs. Fifteen dollars for all of that was a bargain, as she told me when she pressed the bills into my hand. A professional now, I smiled in response. How would Zeke know what to ask, Jack said. When something comes along you never foresaw, how can you know to ask about that? You don't. Running along the chalk line, my infinitesimal stitches would follow the rise of a bust, allowing just enough room for a caught breath. You trust your spouse, I said. I would expect you to tell me anything I need to know. You didn't tell me any too soon about the new baby. It's bad luck to talk too soon about a baby. Luck, he said. What else can you call it? Plenty, he cleared his throat. No one asked you to start seamstressing. Mrs. Cooper did, and then Mrs. Trimble. No one in this house, he said. The air in the room was tightening like a gear, notch by notch. How do you think it looks, Nell? I come in for dinner and my mother's hauling up water, feeding the stove, dishing up the same meal she just cooked. Where is Nell? Nell is sewing. Nell is giving your mother money every week. It isn't enough, he said. It's more than anybody else gets, I said. If Jack would just leave an opening in the conversation, I would be happy to remind him. Mabel Ornette, who never got out of bed, Tilly Hansen, who heard voices, Rose Pruitt. After the first child was born, she gave their cow to a tinker. After the second, her husband, Virgil, came home to find the wagon gone. There had been, there'd been no more children, and people joked that Virgil was afeard of what she'd give away next. It would be my pleasure to remind Jack of this. He said, it must be nice to have your life, everything just the way you want it. Not everything. The look that passed between us could have corroded metal, but he did not say, you may not, or I forbid. Extra household money was not harming his progress toward a gasoline tractor. He did not lift his hand, but when he left the room, I realized I had been crushing the edge of the bodice in my fist, and I had to flat iron it in the morning. That Saturday, when we came wordlessly home from town, I gave his mother $10, half of what I had brought home. I could not keep myself from staring at her hands as she took the bills, smoothed them, and tucked them into her pocket. Handing her the money was the hardest thing I had done all day. Business is picking up, she said. Thank Paris. Your fashionable lady of today is looking toward the new larger sleeves. Mutton sleeves, she said. Leg of mutton, I corrected her, though I knew I would do better to hold my tongue. The style would suit you. Mutton dressed as lamb, she said, not quite contradicting me. My first sewing task for the week would be an opulent blouse for my mother-in-law, who would not pay me for it. The extra work didn't trouble me. My hands trembled now whenever they didn't hold fabric, and I could not stop calculating the difference between the money in my pocket and $110. Behind that amount lay ideas I could not bear to examine too closely, filled with color and bright lights and the sweet taste of oranges. The ideas hovered like ghosts in a doorway, and if I did not raise my eyes, I did not have to acknowledge them. Still, I could feel the ideas pulsing when Jack called me out to the barn to sweep, which I'd promised to do three days before. While I was there, he told me to pick the horse's hooves, too, a task I hated. My mind flew to lustrous cloth and gleaming thread, exacting dresses that grew more difficult as I grew more skilled. I was seeing lines I'd never seen before. For one dress, I sewed buckshot into the back of the hem to make it hang the way I wanted. I had opinions now about the placement of a button, the spacing between two rows of trim. Even when I held no cloth between my hands, I thought about the problems posed by a line and a measurement, and I could lose myself for an hour thinking about ways to gather a waistline. I was worse than Mama, whose dreamy nature was nothing more than a vague mind. My mind wasn't vague at all. It locked onto the problem of a drooping armhole and wouldn't let go. Even when I found a solution, I kept wondering, kept turning the problem around. What if I raised the shoulder higher just there? Wouldn't that be even better? Sometimes Lucille's cry felt as if it reached me across miles, and when it did, I was angry to be called back. The ideas that held my attention had no room for anyone other than myself. That thought, above all, I did not think. Eight stitches to the inch. For a skirt, 100 vertical pleats, 34 waist darts, nine curved hip darts, and four bottom heat pleat, hem pleats. Five blouses to a spool of thread. Three papers of needles for 11 cents. Likewise, 11 cents for a dozen thimbles. A house dress for Mrs. Cooper. A trousseau for Mrs. Horn's oldest girl, though she did not yet have a bow. Things happen so quickly, Mrs. Horn observed. It paid to be prepared, she said. So true, I told her, my eyes demurely downcast. Another skirt for Minnie Closter, paid for in nickels. Having heard about my skills, Mrs. Trimble's sister in Topeka sent me a package with her measurements in eight yards of black silk. 
Mr. Cates was finding room in his store for fabrics we had never seen, potassois, which we could admire but not pronounce, cloth that glittered over the hand. He smiled whenever I entered the store, or, as he noted, once the spring days began to stretch out, when the new baby and I entered the store. That one's coming in the door ahead of you, he said. This one's in a hurry, I said. True and not true. The baby gained weight alarmingly. My belly felt as if it held a cannonball. But unlike Lucille, who had twisted in me like a trout, the new baby moved sluggishly. I should be pleased that this one was not so energetic, I thought, avoiding the words not right, avoiding problem and wrong. I had earned a calm baby. I thought of still water, windless days, the fallow places where nothing grew. Not a family in Mercer County didn't have a child who was simple. Mama called them God's children. Pa called them mouths. They would always eat, but never work. I didn't know what Jack called them and saw no point in asking. The baby moved heavily, an old lady turning over in bed. I would find out Jack's opinion as soon as I needed to. He had avoided me since finding out about the new child, staying away from the women folk like his father. It was my mother-in-law who noted that I was not eating as I had done with Lucille and who stood with her hands on her hips until I drained the glass of buttermilk she gave me, though it tasted like rust, and came back up more often than not. Alert as a wolf, she watched me with increasing concern, an emotion that was mostly offered through her annoyed expression, and when she found me yawning over the churn, she curtly suggested that I try going to bed before dawn. I didn't want any further discord in the house and retired that night after finishing the day's mending. Jack, up with a tetchy calf, was more than an hour behind me. When he drew back the curtain to our room and saw me already in bed, my belly making a tent of the bedclothes, he straightened the quilt over me and went out to sleep in the barn. Since I told him about the new baby, we'd probably not spent 10 hours together in bed, though Lord knows there was nothing to be afraid of now. I slept roughly, hot and troubled. In the daytime, I wore patched gingham dresses. It would not do to swan around now when the ladies of town were themselves just learning how to preen. There was no need for them to know about the finished seams I gave myself, or the secret single covered button, or the cream colored shift with embroidery so fine it seemed part of the delicate cotton lawn I stitched it to. Certainly, there was no need for them to know about the money pocket, as long as an envelope that I attached to my underskirt. $58, 64, 70, 71. Later, I would tell Jack that I sewed right up to the moment I felt my first pain, but this was not true. I sewed well beyond the first pains, setting in the huge sleeves on six shirtwaists for Mrs. Horn, who had said that having me take her measurements made her feel just like she was in Paris, France. <laughs> I wanted her to keep thinking that. The sleeves were so big that she would have to enter room sideways. <laughs> By the time I was finished, contractions had me doubled over. It came on sudden, I told my mother-in-law. I lay on the floor while she pinned a cotton batting pad to Jack's and my corn husk mattress and fed armloads of stalks into the stove. Spasms ripped through me and I felt the floor buck. This isn't going into town the easy way, I said, feeling strangely conversational. This is the bumpy way. You're not going anywhere, my mother-in-law snapped. Bump, 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 I said. She didn't say anything after that. Later, I would remember her braced against the wall, levering me up from the floor while I tipped helplessly from side to side, hardly able to feel my legs. In the end, she had to grab me at the waist and heave me onto the bed, where I lay calmly convinced that my spine was on fire. I don't know where Lucille was. Every time I opened my eyes, my mother-in-law was beside me. Jack is in the field, she told me. I'll get him if there's a need. Not yet, I said. I closed my eyes and opened them, closed them and opened them. The baby seemed to be tearing its way out, ripping things inside of me that I didn't imagine could be made whole again. I heard voices, mamas, Reverend Coopers, but when I opened my eyes, the only person in the room was my mother-in-law, her face gleaming with sweat. A cradle is a pine box, I told her. Hush, she said. By the time a doctor came, a night had passed, and I understood that Jack must have ridden to town. I saw Dr. Johnson and said, go away. Don't be afraid, Jack said. She's not afraid, his mother said, entirely correctly. The baby clung to me like murder, and for every spasm that pushed her down, I could feel her clambering back up. The doctor cut and cut, giving her all the room she needed, but she didn't want room. Finally, he had to clasp the forceps, big paddles, my mother-in-law told me later, with a shudder, around her head and pull her out. I heard all about it later. Yank that baby out like she was a baked potato, my mother-in-law said. <laughs> it was good that Jack had already decided on a name. Amelia, he said, and I nodded. Left to myself, I would have named her Beelzebub. <laughs> 17 years old, I felt 70. 
When my mother-in-law came into the room and lifted the baby from my arms, I pretended to be asleep. There was no reason to protest her taking the baby. Mrs. Cooper had given me a rule. A person needed one year before she could love her child. I slept, then woke asking for ice. Ice, 12 miles out of town. Then slept again before the word was fully out of my mouth. Not until the next day was I clear-headed enough to see my new daughter and every word fled. Her head looked like a gourd squashed at the temples, the mark of the forceps still so clear I could make out over her ears the dents from the metal ridges. I traced them while she rooted at me. Perhaps Lucille had claimed all the available crying. This baby hardly made a sound. Neither did Jack or my mother-in-law or even Lucille. The house was coated in sludgy silence. Jack entered the room, sat beside me for a time, then left again. It was honest conversation. Amelia lay beside me and I watched her not return my gaze. No newborn can focus her eyes, I reminded myself, but still I watched my little girl aimlessly turn her squashed head and felt my heart twist. My mother-in-law, no seamstress, spent Amelia's first days making a cap that hung down to the baby's tiny jaw. She looked like a pilgrim, but the cap disguised the dents. The rain stopped when the baby arrived and the heat came as if it had been away on holiday. Inside the black house with one window and one door, we might as well have been inside the cook stove. My mother-in-law and I waited until the men were out of the house, then walked around in our shifts. Lucille got the hiccups and couldn't stop, and both girls sweated through their diapers. It was too hot to talk, too hot to sleep. All anybody wanted was water, which my mother-in-law fetched because I couldn't carry buckets yet. She watched every drop we drank. Lucille fretfully squirmed away from any touch, but Amelia consented to anything, objecting neither when I carried her nor when I let her lie and then discovered she'd been lying in wet for an hour. It didn't seem possible that a child so new could be tolerant. A newborn is nothing but sensations. Gazing at Amelia's uncomplaining face made a chill race through my heart, although my mother-in-law insisted that the baby was fine, just made from a different cloth from her sister. Mama had not come yet, though Jack had made a point of riding over to tell her that she was a grandmama again. No telling what she might see or say. I closed my eyes against Amelia's hot belly and took a moment's sad comfort there. Both of us slick with heat. Once I regained my strength in, in the hot house with two children to tend, I became quicker than ever. Quicker to lash out, quicker to slap. Maybe I would have done better if I could have slept, but the girls were not interested in my sleep. Once Amelia found her voice, Lucille gained an ally, and now the two babies cried through the night and day, though Amelia could not match her sister's lusty roars. Amelia's cries were spindly and querulous, as if she were asking maddening questions over and over again. Jack and his father spent nights in the barn. For all I knew, they were eating out there, too. I was surviving mostly on pickles straight from the crock, saved washing a plate. Moving stolidly through the days, I rarely bothered to speak. I couldn't think of one thing to say that wasn't expressed by the girls' squalls, which started sometime before dawn and ended when they wore themselves out, and children could persevere. I was sleepless and stupid. When my mother-in-law said, ween, and Lucille, I stared like a cow, unable to fold my brain around the words. You don't have a choice. Both girls need nourishment, not to speak of sleep. Are you hearing me? Not to speak of sleep, I said. She won't be the first child in the world to go off the breast before she's a year. If you give me some milk, I'll make oatmeal. Do you understand what I'm saying? Moo, I said. She handed me a cup. Getting enough milk to make even a small bit of oatmeal took a long time, and it hurt, too. Later, I would hear of a breast pump, but Mr. Cates didn't have such a thing in his store. Jack came in while I was sitting on the edge of the bed, squeezing my breast over the cup. We could just put you in a stall, he said. That'd be simpler. This is plenty simple, I said. I didn't look up. If he, made my, if he made me spill, I'd have to start over, and my blistered nipple felt ready to come off. If you think so, you're the only one, he said, and that would be about regular. I dropped my hot breast and said, I'm not, I am trying to make a situation tolerable. Jack shook his head. It shouldn't be so difficult, but that's you. You're difficult. I wish I'd known that two years ago. Would it have changed anything? I was too tired to bother saying I wasn't the only difficult one. I thought I knew. He mounted a crooked smile. Guess I'm saying your thoughts. I shrugged. What's there to do about it? Behind his brushy black beard, thick now as a bramble hedge, his face was unreadable. He picked up Amelia from the quilt, a rare gesture. What'll we do about baby? What'll we do about thee? What'll we do about baby? Up in the air, one, two, three. 
He didn't toss her very high. Her flailing arm did not touch the low roof over us, but her head flopped on her baby neck. For a moment, I imagined her warped head, no hair at all, nothing like her sister, dropping off her body and wobbling across the room. She didn't make a sound, even when he awkwardly caught her. Stop, I cried. What are you doing? Playing. She's not near strong enough. You can't do that yet. Fine. The fear was on his face and the frustration. I was sorry I'd been so harsh. This moment would not come again. Lucille is old enough, I said. She would love it. There's chores need doing. We can't all sit around and play with babies. When he left, he forgot to draw the sheet. I went back to squeezing my breast, and when my mother-in-law passed, she frowned at me and pulled the sheet to again. The experiment was a waste of time anyway. After all that effort, Lucille spat the mess back at me, staining my remaining clean dress. Not even a year, my mother-in-law said, dabbing at me with her apron. She thinks she shouldn't have to grow up yet. I don't see why not, I said. Now that was just ugly, y'all. <laughs> that was just ugly. <laughs> I'm, I don't like you anymore. I'm taking back my introduction. You're not nice. You're not helpful. <laughs> Vodka. <laughs> Two days after delivering Amelia, <laughs> I had been able to sit up in bed where I could hem by hand. After a week, I made my way to the sewing machine. I went into town with Jack to deliver Mrs. Horn's shirtwaist before the end of my two-week confinement, an outing that I paid for with drawers, petticoat, and skirt all soaked in blood by the time we got home. I made Jack let me out at the garden where I turned around the skirt and covered it with my apron so my mother-in-law wouldn't see, then went in to check on Amelia, who was thinly crying. After that, I doubled up the cloth between my legs and waddled like a duck, but I could resume my calls on the ladies of Grant Station. Lucille came with me. In other people's houses, she became a new child, chuckling and rosy. She's a perfect angel, said the ladies of Grant Station. Does she take after your side or Jack's? She's all her own, I said through the pins between my teeth. Has there ever been a more perfect child, said the ladies, pressing Lucille to their powdered bosoms? I smiled and lowered my eyes it would have been vulgar to gloat. How you must love her, Mrs. Trimble said as I measured her for a wrapper, a garment we could have ordered from the Sears catalog for $1.70. We were calling it a chemise and I was charging her $3.50, Mrs. Trimble's greed for Parisian fashion matching my greed for dollar bills. As I marked the shoulders, she smiled at Lucille, her jowls trembling. Everyone in Grant Station knew that Mrs. Trimble was foolish about babies. If Mr. Trimble had lived, people said she'd have a dozen by now. She sighed, and now you have two, two angels to love. Yes, ma'am. They are perfect innocents, aren't they? They teach us what innocence is, I said. I don't know what tone she heard in my voice, but under the dense pad of fat, her shoulders tightened. You don't sound very loving, she said. Lucille was clutching herself at the edge of Mrs. Trimble's pine side chair and pulling herself to her unsteady feet, where she swayed and grinned at us. Then she sat back down, hard, and after a shocked second, her face screwed up. I knew this instant, before the whales came, the last instant of peace for hours. Dropping the measuring tape, I flew to my daughter, swooped her up, and cradled her against me, half singing, though I was no singer. Surprised, Lucille closed her mouth, then cuddled against my shoulder. Who knows where she learned the gesture? I could not stop myself from pulling her closer, stroking her curls, and touching my mouth to my daughter's milky neck. I pressed my face against the shining skin, knowing it would be better if I did not, and hid my wet eyes in Lucille's snowy bib. Any second, my swollen, reckless heart threatened to burst, and I had no one to blame but myself. That's better, Mrs. Trimble said. I asked in a choked voice whether she would be needing anything else. She paused only a little, watching Lucille cling to me before bringing up the issue of underskirts. Later that week, Jack's father brought, bought the parcel he'd been looking at from Emil Lindstrom's farm to the south, giving us another well, a windmill, and more forage. Jack explained it all to me when he came in from the barn, sly-eyed and grinning, the liquor on him for certain. This puts us in the top third in the county. You're getting somewhere. I shifted Amelia to the other breast. You're making something. Jack shook his head, amused at me. 
We aren't getting anywhere now, we are there. He gazed around the tiny room and I wondered what he saw. He couldn't have been looking at the flaking sod walls barely illuminated by the lamp's brownish light, the stained quilt slung across a narrow bed that filled the space, the side-by-side -side rough cradles that I didn't like to touch for the splinters Lucille breathed noisily in hers. He said, we've worked hard, I'm proud of you. Embarrassment made me smile. I gazed down at Amelia who wouldn't notice a silly expression on her mother's face. When Pa and I were in town this afternoon, I went out on the street and looked. I could tell which dresses you made. I told Pa that you are Grant Station's Beautification Society. Just ask him, he'll tell you that's what I said. Jack, there's no one else got a wife like you. He crossed the room and put his hand on my waist. You have the best mama, don't you, he said to Amelia. She's good to have around and she gives the eyes something to rest on. Jack, hush, that's no talk for a baby. I'm trying to tell you something. I hear you, so do your parents. By now my embarrassment was flaming from my cheeks down across my chest. The breast Amelia was sucking on was red as a poppy. It's time to celebrate, Jack said. Maybe we'll build our own house for you and me and our thousands of children. I nodded wordlessly, hot under his gaze, and hotter still when Amelia finished and Jack lifted her from my arms, burped her with surprising expertise, and settled her into her cradle. Then he turned to me. Let's make the next one a boy, he said. He leaned against me and untied the strings of my shift. I was certain we could not make a son, this or any night. What Dr. Johnson had torn in fetching Amelia would never heal itself. But I would be lying if I didn't allow that Jack's embrace was a comfort his hard hand a pleasure against my back. Everything until now has been work, he murmured. Now things will get easier. Easier? With more land? I laughed and he joined me. Pa hired on all three of Emil's hands. They know the place better than Emil does. With my new tractor, I can till 40 acres in a day. You'll see now, by the end of next season, we'll be money ahead. I had, I had hidden my face in his neck where I smelled the comfortable dust and sweat. Lying like this, with my husband beside me and both of the girls content, it would be easy to fall asleep. In the morning, I could present Jack the dollar bills that bloated the pocket of my skirt, a pledge toward a new house on our new land. We would build that house together. I tried to imagine his face when I gave him the money, the surprised gratitude. I tried several times to think of him wearing the unfamiliar expression or my hand holding out the bills. Every time, my brain stopped like a balky horse. For a year now, I had used my thoughts like a pick and shovel to create tunnels underneath the ground of Mercer County existence, and I dwelled in those tunnels. When, when the unthinkable thought had first presented itself, I simply made room for it, a life with electric lights, with buildings and streetcars without children. I made room until the thought was the obvious one, the only one, running ev under every day and night. I could not unthink it now without letting the walls of the tunnels cave in on me. My brain was careening. Wildly, I tried to imagine the house filled with light, or the cows turning and talking English to us, or Jack and me joyful in the morning to see each other. The sorrow was like lightning, and I clung to Jack, who stroked my hair. He said, you have walked with me every step, even when you might shouldn't have. You've been right there. I know I don't always say so. Hush. It wants saying. I'm appreciative. I know that. Goodness, you're my husband his whiskey and leather and sweat smells. I had always liked them. Not everything needs saying, I said. This does, he said. Going into town today, I felt like I saw you. You were everywhere, all over Grant Station. You're a part of the place. I was here at home with your children. I'm telling you something. There's nobody here doesn't know you. Town folk, I said scornfully. Sometimes that could distract him. He shook his head. Even if you're here at home with the babies, you're everywhere a body look. Christ, Nell, it's a compliment. Not one I care for. Fine. His voice wasn't just angry, which I was prepared for, but offended. He might have spent the whole ride home working to create a compliment for me, shaping it as he would shape a bench or fence rail. But Jack was a rough carpenter. When I pointed out a, cart, a corner where the pieces of wood didn't join, he would say, no one would see that but you. For him, a task was finished or not. Levels of expertise did not occur to him, or the pleasures of harmony, two lines coming together so snugly that the place where they met was invisible. Surely that was beauty. But if Jack had been looking for beauty, he would say now, he wouldn't have married me. Me, Nell? I knew what my marriage had taught me. Jack Platt wouldn't recognize me if I passed him on the street. He said, you can't meet me even a little, can you? 
How can I, unless you want me to be like you, going into town and seeing things that aren't there? It was a purely idiot thing to say, selfish and mean. Between the two of us, it wasn't Jack who saw things that weren't there. But my, mean, but my meanness held back my tears. He took me then, rougher than he ever had, and I couldn't blame him. After he finished, he eventually said, you don't know the first thing about giving. You're a selfish wife and a selfish mother. It's a sad thing to see. Don't look, I said. I don't see the point in pleasing a woman who won't be pleased. Tomorrow, you start helping Mama in the kitchen again. I have orders to fill. The fear welled through my voice. I could tell from their sudden stillness that the girls heard it. It's time for you to remember that you're part of a family. He pulled on his boots and then went back to the barn. To my surprise, he came back an hour later, said nothing, and passed out on top of the quilt. We rose together at four o'clock, he to tend the cows, I to decorate the edge of a cape for Mrs. Horn with two yards of braid. He came back in for breakfast, and I went to the kitchen to chop salt pork. When I picked up the cape again after Jack left the house, my hands were soft from pork fat and the sand I'd used to scrub them. Jack said nothing more, but I could feel his eyes on me, and I felt as if I were racing to cross a field before it collapsed beneath me. I made myself so faster, losing some precision, but turning out a dozen skirts a day. Mrs. Cooper said I was a genie, which I liked when she defined it for me. Would Mr. Cooper approve of you knowing about heathen spirits, I said? Does Mr. Platt approve of your knowledge of thread? The subject has not presented itself, I said. Just so with the gene, she said. Would you like cake? She smiled, and I smiled. I always lingered with Mrs. Cooper. I now made the round of houses in Grant Station in a single morning and had learned not to accept any tea or my bladder, still loose from Amelia, would make me miserable before it was time to go home. I took orders and measurements, then went to see Mr. Cates and examine the new fabric that had arrived. Ten weeks after Amelia was born, the Reverend's wife wanted a suit, a complicated project. Mr. Cates had found me a brown velvet as soft as a pelt, and I picked out black buttons for the trim. Even working with my new gin-like speed, I needed two weeks to make the suit as I taught myself the slimmer lines from Mrs. Cooper's sister's Harper's Bazaar. It seemed strange to be working without any kind of bustle at all, the corseted waist riding right over the exposed hips. I wasn't sure the immodest fashion was one a reverend's wife should be wearing, but Mrs. Cooper had not asked my opinion, and the lines would certainly become her. In the kitchen, my mother-in-law praised Lucille for swallowing one spoonful of oatmeal until the proud girl swallowed a second. In a week, Lucille would turn one year old. Even after I gave my mother-in-law a portion of my earnings, the pocket in my underskirt was stuffed with dollar bills, 82, 96. The night after I attained $113, I lay awake, listening to Amelia's slightly clotted breathing and the smooth rush of Lucille's baby snores. Jack had come into the house after dinner and noted me bent over the sewing machine while his mother scrubbed the supper pots. Without a word, he pushed me back, gently, it must be admitted, and carried the singer out the door. The cast iron machine could not have been easy to lift, but he didn't make a sound then or later when he loaded it onto the wagon and drove away. By the next day, I heard about Lorene Silver, thrilled when her daddy told her she would be getting Nell Platt's sewing machine. I heard about it from Myrtle Marsh, who heard from Mrs. Horn, who heard from Mr. Cates, who was telling everybody. That night I lay alone, noting how my blood hastened across my temples and over my wrists. It raced as if it were looking for an exit, I thought, and smiled grimly. Outside, the wind was light. Coyotes must have been skulking near the barn. One of the cows complained. Even at the stillest hour, a person could go deaf from the noise. In the morning, nervy as a grass snake, I put on my underskirt, brushed Lucille's curls, straightened Amelia's cap, and set their cradles in the kitchen. You're dressed early, said my mother-in-law. Ba, 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 said Lucille. Ba, 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 I echoed. And in bright spirits, too, my mother-in-law said. Ba, 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 Lucille shrieked happily. She'll be talking any day now. Jack's first word was milk, but we didn't know that for a long time. He pronounced it Moki. <clears throat> My mother-in-law's long, rough face had softened, and I noted how the line of her cheek fell exactly as Jack's had in our courting days when we sat on the edge of the bench on Pa's house, and he looked hopeful and confident. When a person stands on the edge of change, everything she sees feels like a portent. What was your first word, Jack's mother said. I don't know. You should ask your mother. Mama recalls different things. The day a crow landed on her wash line, she found out later that her cousin had passed on. I'll bet I heard 50 times about the day the wagon axle broke exactly when Pa was hearing the new tax assessment. She reckons that the world sends her signals. My husband should have consulted with her before buying the Lindstrom's land. 
Mom is not much on land values, I said. Jack's mother and I smiled at each other, and then I looked away, my eyes stinging. Baba, I said to Lucille. Ba! she yelled. <laughs> her noise chased Jack's mother, Eveline. Her name was Eveline from the room. After Lucille finished eating, I put her in her cradle. Mercifully, the, her the heat made her dozy. I paused only long enough to touch her hair, though she scowled at me. I lingered a moment more over Amelia, who gazed at me with her dark blue infant eyes, her expression placid now that she'd eaten. The forceps marks had gone away by now, and her hairless little head let me see her pink ears, hardly bigger than my thumbnail. She cooed when I fanned her. In the bedroom, I made a package with Mrs. Cooper's suit, then slipped out of the house and began the walk to town. I moved quickly, still wearing my gingham dress. Anyone would think I was going to tend chickens. I got as far as the turn at Emil's farm before Mr. Cates's boy came along in his wagon and took me the rest of the way, three silent hours. I had him let me out in front of the feed and seed, and I dawdled under the statue of Lincoln until the boy's sulky wagon had rounded the corner. Only then did I walk to the train station. In the ladies' lounge, I put on Mrs. Cooper's suit, a little loose at the waist. Probably I'd be glad about that after 12 hours on a train. I gathered the money from my underskirt pocket, adding a dollar to my purse in case I needed a lemonade or a sandwich. Then I sat for a long time on the bench. The train would arrive at 1535, as I knew in my sleep. Sitting without even piecework to busy my hands felt strange, and I kept looking for things to distract me. Twice, when my thoughts veered toward Lucille, I gazed at the lamps overhead, grimy and cloaked in cobwebs. For three hours, I sat and did not see a soul except the railroad boys and the ticket collector. No one left Grant Station. This had been my safety all along. Years later, I could recall the lamps in detail. When the train came, a porter lifted me up, since my new skirt was too fashionably tight at the ankles to permit such a high step. Thank you.